Praise the Lord. We we'll rise up as we pray together. I want you to close your eyes and talk to the Lord that has come to the Bible study today. That the words of Jesus will reach out to your heart. You take it in. You live by it. So that your life will bring glory to God. So that these words of Christ will bear the appropriate fruit in your life. And the day to day feasting on the word will make you spiritually strong, scripturally enlightened, and then you'll be properly placed in the kingdom of God. That God will make you not a dwarf, a sick, sickly, spiritual child, but a strong, vibrant giant, courageous, bold, fearless, to live for the glory of God. And the courage to stand for the truth. Honestly contending for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints. The courage and spiritual inner fortitude and strength. The Lord will give to you. You will not be crippled spiritually. In Jesus' name we pray. Can do better than that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come once again to study your watch tonight. Your watch is a light in our pathway. And Lord, as we pray, as we shine the light of this glorious gospel, the very words of Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Lord, we pray we receive the light. We'll walk in the light. We'll lay by the light. And our life will be different in our communities in Jesus' name. These are days when false prophets and false professors are multiplying. And Lord, we pray at such a time like this, we'll stand, we'll strength the strength of the Lord. Our spiritual backbone and spine will stand erect. And nothing will paralyze us in Jesus' name. That we were preachers of the word. Nothing and nobody will be able to muscle and shut our mouths. But we'll speak the word with boldness, courage, and fearlessness. So that, Lord, sinners will come out of their sins. And the believers will stand faithful to this word of the Lord in Jesus' name. You made this church a teaching church, giving us a teaching ministry. And we pray that this special privilege you have given to us as a church will remain and abide with us. And nothing will take it away from us in Jesus' name. Any other thing that will compete with this word of the living God, crush that sin out of our lives. And crush that sin out of this church. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say another amen. Thank you very much. You can see now. We're coming to the study of the Bible tonight. And when Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, the ravening wolves, ye shall know them by their fruits. Stop there for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ said, beware, be aware, be warned, be watchful, be weary of all these people that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly in their heart. 
in their spirit, in their mind, in their motive, in their desires, in their inward ambition. They are not coming to feed you. They are not coming to help you. They come to destroy. And they come to devour. And they come to take away your spiritual life. It says, beware therefore, take heed. Beware of those false prophets. They will come to you. The Lord implies there that you will not go to them. The Lord implies that when you come to the Lord, you have satisfaction. And you have enough that makes you steady and stable. That you will not go to them. The implication is there. That if you're a real child of God. A genuine bona fide member of the church of the living God. You will not go unto them. But they will come to you. That's why it says which come to you in sheep's clothing. And then it says but notice this. Whatever their exterior, outside life portrays, inwardly, the ravening wolves. You are seeing them, but I cannot see into their mind. I cannot see into their heart. I cannot see into their inward motive and ambition. And since all this is hidden in their heart, how then will I know? It says you'll know them by what? By their fruits. It says, ye shall know them by their fruits. Now, whenever the Bible uses that word fruit, it means quite a number of things. Number one, it means the character. Look at this in the word of God. In um, Proverbs chapter 11, the character, the fruit, the fruit is the character, is the behavior, is the conduct, is the lifestyle. Ye shall know them by their fruits. In Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Say that. It is righteousness or unrighteousness. He shall know them by their fruits. We're looking at Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, we're looking at verse 8. Luke chapter 3 verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. That's character. That's behavior. That's conduct. That's lifestyle. Ye shall know them by their lifestyle. By their behavior. By their character. In Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading verse 11. Philippians chapter 1 verse 11. Ye shall know them by their fruits. What fruit? The behavior. It says in verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. That means then. As we consider the fruit. We're considering their character. Ye shall know them by their character. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11. No chastening now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it shielded for the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Unto the people, unto them which exercise thereby. Number one, therefore, the fruit is character. Number two, the fruit is the creed. The doctrine, the belief, the preaching, what comes out of their mouth. Notice that when it says, ye shall know them by their fruits. They say, number one, you know them by their character. Number two, you know them by their creed. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 12. In Proverbs chapter 12, I'm looking at verse 14. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 14. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. The utterance of his mouth. The teaching of his mouth. The doctrine of his mouth. The declaration of his mouth. The proclamation of his mouth. The fruit is the doctrine. Is the teaching. Is what comes out of his mouth. In Proverbs chapter 18 verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. 
I'd say, say, Lord, it's talking about actually there as somebody, a salesman, a trader. The way he is able to talk and the way he's able to present what he has that will make him sell. And what he sells will give him money and the money he has will fill his belly. He'll be satisfied by the fruit, by the declaration, by the profession, by the utterance of his mouth. Therefore, then, as we look at the fruit, we're looking at the creed, the doctrine, the belief, the utterance, the proclamation, the preaching of those people. He shall know them by their creeds, by their utterance, by their declaration, by their preaching, by their doctrine. In Hebrews, I'm reading from chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The things we say, this happens to be the things we say in prayer. The things we say in praise. The things we say in preaching. The utterance of the mouth, the fruit. Number one, then, when we talk about the fruit, we're talking about their character. Number two, we're talking about the creed. Number three, we're talking about the converts. The converts, you see, and that's the fruit of their ministry. That's the outcome of their ministry. That's the product of their ministry. That is the evidence of who they are as preachers, as prophets, as pastors, as proclaimers of the words they proclaim. What they preach. Ye shall know them by their fruits, by their converts. By their followers, by their disciples. And whenever you see that word fruit, it refers to, you know, human beings, other times, the followers, the members of that church, the disciples of that evangelist, of that preacher, of that pastor, the fruit. In Exodus, I'm reading from chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. Reading from verse 22. Exodus 21. Verse 22. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her. You see that fruit there? The child. The woman is pregnant. And these two men were striving, struggling together. And in their striving, in their struggling, in their fighting, they hurt a woman pregnant with child. And the fruit, the child, departs from her. So then, you understand, when we say fruit, it can mean the character. It can mean the creed. It can mean the child. It can mean the convert. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 12. Isaiah 10 verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass. That when the Lord has performed this whole work. Upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king. I'll punish the fruit. Now, you cannot punish an utterance. You cannot punish a doctrine. You cannot punish a character. You punish the people, the person, the fruit of the stout heart of the king. That is, of the bold, aggressive, cruel, wicked king. I'll punish the people that follow, the followers of such a stout-hearted King, the fruit, the converts, the children, the followers, the disciples. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 2. We're looking at verse 30. For you to know that when we use the word fruit, we may be referring to the followers, the disciples, the children, the converts of such an individual. Acts chapter 2 verse 30. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that 
of the fruit of his loins. According to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Of the fruit of his loins, that is, of the children to come out of him, he will raise up Christ that will sit upon the throne. In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading verse 13. Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Now, I would not have the ignorant brethren that oft times, often times, I purposed to come unto you, but was led, was hindered, was prevented hitherto, that I might have some fruit, some comfort, some disciples, some followers among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul the apostle had gone to many gentle cities and he had preached the gospel there. And many people have come to the Lord. And then he came back and said, Praise the Lord. In Iconium, I have some fruit, some converts. And then in Philippi, I have some fruits, I have some converts. And then in this other place at Corinth, I have some fruits, some converts. Now I'm coming to Rome. And when I come to you, my purpose of coming to you in Rome is that I might have some fruits, some disciples, some converts among you also. So then you understand when Jesus said, you shall know them. By their fruits. Number one, you'll know them by their character. Those false prophets. You don't just be swallowed in. And you don't just get in because of what somebody is saying. Or because of what he's preaching. Or because of his charisma. His ability and skill. Look at his life. His character. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Number two, ye shall know them by their creed. The creed. The doctrine. Then number three, you'll know them by their converts. We'll come back to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading to you from verse 15 and now you understand better. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but in wordly. The ravening wolves. But Lord, I want to be able to recognize them, to know them, to identify them. How will I be able to do that? Then he tells us in verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Watch their character, you'll know them. Watch their creed. Watch their doctrine. Watch their utterances. Watch their preaching. And watch their beliefs. And watch their proclamation. You shall know them by their fruits. And then you watch their converts. The people that go to those ministries. The people that attend those churches. The lifestyle of those people. Of those converts. Watch them. Ye shall know them by their converts. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Of figs, of thistles, so even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And then verse 20. In verse 20, it says again, wherefore by their fruits. Must be pretty important, significant for the Lord to repeat that again. He had said that in verse 16. And now he says in verse 20 again, he said, you must recognize them. And you must recognize them not by the sheep's clothing that they wear. And not by the outward exterior things that they manifest or demonstrate. You will watch their fruits, their converts. By their fruits ye shall know them. You see, the Lord was using the symbol or the illustration of the shepherd and the sheep. And most sheep can easily be deceived into accepting and hiring, wearing sheep's clothing. Most believers even experience Samuels. They can easily be misled and be impressed by the outward qualities and characteristics of false prophets and false manifestations. And you know, that's the way we are. You see a man and then his posture is standing. 
his appearance, and any skill, his ability will sway you without knowing what's in the heart of that man. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. For Samuel chapter 16, reading from verse 6 all through to verse 7. In chapter 16, verse 6, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. I'm telling you, Samuel was an experienced prophet, and yet he made a mistake in this area. And no matter how experienced we are, many times, because that's the human nature, we're always looking at the exterior. You want to get married, you're looking at the exterior of the man. You're looking at the external features of the woman. You're not looking at the heart, at the behavior. You're not looking at what is coming out of her mouth. You want to, you know, be a friend to somebody. You're looking at the way they carry themselves in the open. And you want to choose a worker in the church. You're looking at the external, periphery, outside things. You do not know their intention, their ambition, their motive, their experience, internal. And what the Lord is telling us, he says, quit being just human. Become spiritual and look beyond the outside, the external, and look at the very heart. By their fruits, you shall know them. Then in verse 7, here is what we are told about the Lord said unto Samuel. Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature. We can easily be deceived. You know, that's how Absalom deceived Everybody in the nation, that that man, he has a kind of charisma, a kind of ability, a kind of skill. And he, he deceived virtually everybody. Ahithophel was the wisest of the people. Whenever Ahithophel spoke to David, it was like an angel talking. And Absalom, looking at the exterior, looking at the way he comported himself, he even deceived Ahithophel. Think about that. And eventually this man, not having the spirit of God, the grace of God, only the external beauty and being handsome externally, deceived everybody. And that's why the Lord is saying, don't be taken in, deceived by the skill, the ability, the outward appearance of anyone. For the Lord looketh on the heart. And then it says, not on the outward appearance. That is why if Samuel could make a mistake... If Ahithophel could destroy his life and eventually committed suicide because he was taken in and deceived by an Absalom. You want to be very careful that no false prophet deceives you. Jesus said, look away from the outside external manifestations inwardly, the revenue wolves. Our process of admitting workers into this church, leaders into this church, Preachers into this ministry must go beyond the evaluation of their sheep's clothing, which human skill can make and wear. What the prospective workers and preachers are inwardly is more important than all the impressive outward qualities. But what if we have difficulty discerning a prophet's inward desire, inward ambition, inward motivation? How else can we identify false prophets? That's exactly what Jesus is saying. And that's exactly why we're here tonight. God will give us wisdom. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Men do not limit to the leaves, themselves to the leaves, or the backs of the flowers of the tree, to evaluate or identify the tree. The flowers of a tree may be beautiful and fragrant. The foliage, that is the leaves, may be thick and green. The appearance may be great and gorgeous. But the fruit is what determines its identity and its usefulness. The outward appearance, the public image, the physical environment, the external worship, and the visible image and the visible resources of a prophet preacher may be impressive and attractive. But we must ask what is the quality of the fruit being produced? If a man in sheep's clothing has the nature of a wolf and produces corrupt fruit, 
His appearance may be meek, having apparent meekness, gentleness, devotion, seal, affability, and good humor. All those things mean nothing. They are meant to deceive and to destroy the sheep. When Satan transforms himself and becomes an angel of light, we must not allow that to deceive us. In fact, we're told that in Revelation chapter 9, the tormentors that will torment men and women and children for five months with terrible pain of the scorpion sting. They'll wear the crowns of gold and have the faces of men and the hair of women. If you're looking at the exterior, you'll be poisoned. And then the people of God must not be deceived. We must examine the fruit, the character, the creed. The conduct, the deeds, the behavior, and now the followers, the disciples, the members that congregate and worship with those people, you shall know them by their fruits. We're going to look at this study, the study you have it on the outline, knowing false prophets through their fruits, through their followers. We divide to three points. Number one, corrupt fruits of faulty preaching corrupt fruits of faulty preaching number two carnal followers of false prophets carnal followers of false prophets number three courageous firmness we need courage god will give you courage i said god will give courage and I'm telling you, some of these uh, false prophets are bold, fearless, and courageous. The way they carry themselves. They're militant. They're aggressive. And if you are timid and weak and the false prophet comes, and he comes boldly in an aggressive manner, and then he serves, he wants to serve Satan, and he wants to declare the mind of Satan unto you. And it's not a coward. It's a person that, you know, carries himself. And he has the posture of this uh, of these kind of effective, powerful, mighty, skillful proclaimers of their error. And then you are a coward. There is, there is no boldness. You are fearful. They'll suck you in. But it's when you have the courage of a person that is enlightened. The courage of a person that has a principle. The courage of a person that has conviction. It is then you'll be able to stand against all those wiles of the devil coming from those false prophets. Courageous firmness against false prophets. Number one, corrupt fruits of faulty preaching. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. You will meet their members in your community. You will see their disciples in your place of work. And you will see how they, they, don't, they don't count it anything to steal, to bribe, or to change receipts. That's their fruit. Those are the converts. And we're not just talking about an isolated person. Because a person may be a good preacher. And may be a faithful preacher. Like Moses. And there may be Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. But those are just few people. A person may be as good as Joshua. There may be an Achan. We cannot judge a prophet, a preacher, a pastor by just one convert. By just one disciple. By just one Achan. A person might be as good as Paul the Apostle. And there may be a Demas that you meet that has come from the ministry and fellowship of Paul. We cannot judge by just one convert, by just one Demas. But we look at all their converts at the general thing in this community, in that community, in that community. And we see their lifestyle. And we see their behavior. And then we see everything is carnal, everything is corrupt, and everything is is away from the word 
word of God, then we say we're not judging the man on one Achan. We're not judging the man on just one Judas. We're not judging the man on just one Demas. But they all, all his disciples, all his followers, all the people that attend this fellowship, look at their lifestyle. Ye shall know them by their fruits. That's what the Lord is saying over there. And then in verse 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. What do these people do? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 17. And this is what they do. This is their preaching. And this is why their preaching has such a corrosive and corrupt and carnal impact and influence on the people that listen to them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Corrupt the word of God. Those preachers. And Paul the apostle said, there are many. There are many. Those preachers. False prophets. But we, what, what did he say? We, we, Paul, Timothy, Titus, Silvanus, Silas, we are not like many of them corrupting the word of God. And then it says, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God we speak in Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Here Paul the apostle said, I know what I taught you. And when I taught you and gave your life to the, you gave your life to the Lord, you were brought into grace. Whatever that brings you into this grace, that's another gospel preached by the false prophets. You see, the life of a real child of God who is listening to the word of God, his life will be gracious. But the one who is listening to the false prophet, his life will be degrading. Corrupt, carnal, evil, sinful. And you can tell by the kind of life he lives, he's been listening to something else apart from the word of God. In verse 7, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be, what's the word? Accursed. Paul the apostle is so serious about this. He said, anybody that will try to distract somebody, Anybody that will try to derail somebody and get him away from the path that leads to heaven and leads that person now to the path and to the way of hell, that fellow is making those people to be accursed and he himself let him be accursed. It's terrible on those false prophets. And then he says in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, that if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And you know, we're not just talking about the people outside. We're talking about the people inside here. Uh, you, you know what? Whenever you come here to the central church, you hear the undiluted word of God that will prepare you to live a righteous life, a holy life, a pure life, a, kind, a sinless life. Why not? A perfect life. Why not? That will lead you unto heaven, unto the way eternal. But you know, we're not just influenced by the central church here. We're divided into districts and groups. And divided into regions and divided into states and then we're into many nations. Not only that. In a local church, we're divided into women's section and the men's section and the youth section and the choir and the ushers and the security. Different, different sections. And all the leaders of those different sections, they also preach. And they also tell you something. 
They are only true. They are only believable. They are only serviceable. If they declare the same word you have heard centrally here. But if any sectional leader in any church talks to a group of people and he talks to them and teaches them to become careless, to become sinful, to deride, to depreciate, to destroy holiness. That's a false prophet right there. Let him be accursed. In the church, in every section of the church where we have those leaders, you want to emphasize the same word of God. You want to emphasize the same doctrine that leads us into life eternal. Now, if you have a section, a section in the church, and you find that the workers in that section, the people in that section, looks like they have funny behavior, funny character. And they have a kind of derailing attitude that will diverge the people of God away from the truth into error, into carelessness. The leader who has been leading them there has been poisoning them, has been teaching them and telling them some erroneous things. And the word of God says, if anyone in any section, in any church, in any district, in any region, in any state, if anyone preaches any other sin, apart from this unchanging, immutable word of God, it says, let that person, whoever that person may be, is a false prophet in a church where we're teaching sound doctrine. Let him be accursed. Is that serious? That's why you want to watch the people you listen to, even within the church. You watch their character and you watch their creed, you watch their doctrine and you watch their converts, you watch the people that are following them. Are they living in holiness or and righteousness? Do they appreciate the totality of the word of God or is there another spirit? That is directing them or controlling them. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 26. The corrupt fruits of faulty preaching. Acts chapter 20. Verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day. That I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. And to all the flock. Over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God. Which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this. That after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Not sparing the flock among you, among you, shall grievous wolves enter in among you. And you see that the preachers of the Bible days, they were not, you know, cowards that will cover their mouths and they will not be able to tell the truth to their congregations. And of course, those wolves among them, they'll be there in the congregation. Paul, the apostle, I know this. This is, this is not suggestion. This is not imagination. This I know by inspiration and revelation. I know this, that after my departing, Shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Look up here for a moment. Here we are. And as a church, united church together, we're following Christ. And all the people, all the members, all the disciples belong to Christ. But somebody rises up within us, false prophet. He has an ambition. He wants to take the loyalty of the people to himself. 
not to Christ. The obedience of the people for himself, not to Christ. The reliance of the people unto himself, not to Christ. He has been made a leader in that section. And instead of encouraging all the disciples, all the members, to listen to the central truth that is coming unto us, he wants to sway the minds of the people so that he will be the solitary authority that everybody will listen to. And it will divert the minds of the people from the central church so that you'll find in the youth section there are youths that will not follow the teaching that God is giving us through our general superintendent. And it'll follow that individual there. Whatever he tells them in the choir. Then they'll follow that leader there. In the ushers, they'll follow that leader there. And then they fragment and divide the church so that this one will have his own disciples. That one will have his own disciples. And then we're, we're distracted from the centrality of the truth, of the word of God. That's what the apostle is commenting about. That he said also among you, your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember. That by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Now, it says, everybody now come back to the central theme, but start it you now. Brethren, I commend you to, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. This one will build you up. In all those uh, false prophets, they'll tear you down. They want to pull you down. And they want to destroy your conviction, your commitment to the word of God, your courage, your stamina. They want to weaken you, paralyze you spiritually. But it's when you come back to the word, it says, able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. We're going to stand by the word of God. Whatever fruit any preacher produces, it is through the preaching, the fruit of life, the fruit of labor, the fruits of character, the fruits of the converts, the fruit of belief and behavior, the fruit of doctrine and disciples, the fruit of families in families and followers. All these are produced by the seed we sow, by the messages we preach. The greatest power for deception and destruction, which the false prophet has, is his faulty preaching. He, he corrupts the word of God, not only by misquoting it, but by misusing it and misinterpreting it. He makes his hearers believe a lie. Not, to, not by denying the straight gate, by, not by denying the straight gate and the narrow way, but by never speaking on them. He'll never speak of the cross, of self-denial, of the necessity of holiness. He'll, he'll read the Bible, but he'll take some things from the Bible, just motivational things. But the real nitty-gritty of the word of God that will lead us to life eternal. The straight gate, the narrow way, the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They never talk about that. They'll talk about the love and the mercy of God, but not about the holiness of God, about the righteousness of God, about the wrath of God, about the justice of God. No, they don't talk about all those things. The false prophet may not openly deny God's revelation on the final judgment and eternal destiny of the lost, but... He never wants his hearers of the wrath to come. That is the false prophet. Avoid them like you avoid a plague. Run away from them like you run away from snakes and serpents. I come to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at the canal followers of the false prophets. Canal followers of the false prophets. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Once again, let me remind you that we have already mentioned that the fruits will mean, number one, the character. Number two, the creed. Number three, the converts. The converts, those are the followers. The converts, those are the disciples. 
They converse. Those are the believers in that ministry, in that fellowship, in that church, in that section there. The followers, the disciples, those who are following after that leader. Before the church grew like this, it used to be just one united church. And the lifestyle of everyone in any section of the church was totally based and determined on the word we hear at the monthly, at the weekly Monday Bible study. We were strong with a united heart, united force. And we ate from the same table and we had the same conviction. But as we grew, we had to, you know, divide what can we do as a large church. Divide into districts, into groups, into sections of work. And uh, then we have to put leaders over them. What can we do? And then the church, as we go into those different sections, we then begin to have different influences upon those different sections. And then we became divergent in our behavior because we're no more eating the same spiritual food. But as we come back and make it a one central church, a strong church, a church that feeds on the word of God, and we're not listening to any other distracting message or instruction, then our behavior once again will be similar. We'll have the nature of God and then we'll have the nourishment of this vital truth of scripture. I pray that whatever poison any one of us has kind of taken in, God will purge everyone. And then the word of God that is solid. The word of God that makes us to think about heaven and think about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The word of God that affects our motive, our ambition, our mind, our disposition, our heart, our lifestyle, our marriage, our weddings, our finding the will of God. There will be no difference from one district to the other. From one group to the other. There will be no carefulness somewhere, carelessness, another place. But it will be the same standard of the word of the living God. And that centrality of truth with its power. That centrality of truth in its penetrating punching a uh, punching kind of authority will come back to our lives and then we'll know this uh, the church of the living god and the disciples are the disciples of christ i said we'll be the disciples of christ not the disciple of a backslider there, the disciple of a wayward man there, the disciple of a false prophet there, the disciple of a grumbling person member minister there, but the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ standing on the same truth of the living God. This church will stand. I said this church will stand. If you have the same mind with Christ and you want the church to stand, you will block your ears from listening to any other divergent message of a false prophet inside here, inside here. And then you listen to the word that will take you to heaven. That's why we came to the Bible study. How do we come to Bible study and then the word of God will not cleanse and scrub and wash and purge and purify us. The word will purge us tonight. We're looking at the canal followers of false prophets. In verse 16 of Matthew chapter 7, you shall know them. By their fruits, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, 
every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree, a corrupt leader, a corrupt preacher, a corrupt prophet bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree, corrupt preacher, corrupt leader, corrupt minister, corrupt evangelist, corrupt pastor, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. In Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 15. One to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him to forge more child of hell than yourselves. Do you see that those were the preachers of the day? Those were the proclaimers, the gospelers, that's what they call themselves of the day. Those were the ministers, the servants, representatives of God of that day. And Jesus, they were so zealous. You will think that if anybody is zealous, he must be a good preacher, must be a good prophet, he must be a good evangelist. If he compasses land and sea, if he's so fanatical about it and is here and there and there, you will think that must be a real servant of God. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were like that. He compassed sea and land, so zealous. You know, if you are just looking for how, how kind of a skillful man of ability and man of skill and man of real, real excited, thin man of energy. If you're looking for something like that, you'll be deceived. If you're saying, brother, so and so cannot be wrong. He is so zealous. Hey, brother, so and so cannot teach anything wrong. He is so committed to this sin. That he'll compass land and sea. He endangers his life. That's how the Pharisees did it. All the same. They were false prophets. Look at their message. Look at their influence. Look at the impact of their influence on other people. Look at their influence on uses. They began to influence your life. When the message over here was the only thing that influenced your life. You know how you were. When the central truth was the only thing that influenced your life. You know how serious and zealous and committed and consecrated you were. But look at the impact of all the other influences coming. Influences of people who are zealous. They're always there. They come past land and sea. But then it says to make one proselyte, one disciple, one follower, one convert. And then you say it after it's made, you make him twofold child of hell than yourself. And then he said in verse 33, ye serpents and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, here is revelation here. All those, all the skill, all the energy, all the enthusiasm, all the fanatism that you see. In all those false preachers, it is a kind of a motivation from the evil spirit. It says, and then the doctrine, their doctrines of devils, and they speak lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. If you ever find that your conscience is no more sensitive, that your conscience is hardened, seared with a hot iron, looks like you'll be listening to doctrines of devils. Looks like seducing spirits have been influencing you. When the Holy Spirit influences us, our consciences are tender. And the false prophets, that's the impact and the influence of those false prophets. Have you seen the followers of those false prophets? You try to talk to them. And you open the scriptures like this, and everything is plain and clear. And you see, 
see this. Now, I didn't try this. My brother, you even respected my sister. See this. And after you've read each and the thing is so plain and so clear, the fellow will shake his head and say, I see that, but I don't agree. Why don't you agree? I just don't agree. We don't practice that in our church. And the conscience is seared with a hot iron. And if your conscience is like that, it's an evidence. You have been influenced by false prophets somewhere. You. You have been influenced by false prophets. If your conscience is no more tender, if you can premeditate something evil, and do it without blinking an eye, and do it without feeling any sin in your conscience, Somebody else apart from the faithful, truthful prophet of God has been influencing you. That's why today you need to turn around and say, all other extraneous influence upon my life, upon your life, today they're going to be cancelled. And then we come and we center our affection, our understanding, our conviction on this word of God that we are being taught by the faithful teachers of the word of God in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1 now. There's no also that in the last days perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And that's why what false preaching does, it makes people to only think about themselves. My prosperity, my inheritance, my right, my happiness, my goodness, my joy, my promise, everything in my mind makes themselves centered. When you listen to all these false prophets and they tell you grab this and get this and gain this and claim that, it makes you self-centered. And then when you, when you think of what you do, everything is just about yourself. And if anything does not please you, then everybody is in trouble. It says when those false prophets, when they influence our lives, Perilous times, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, that means they go to church. They have a form of godliness. Then it says, but denying the power thereof. What's the last line? Tell me with confidence. Tell me like you are going to do it. From such turn away. And you know some of these uh, false prophets, maybe you've grown to love them. I just like the man. I like the way he stands and the way he talks. You know, he's such a nice person. He's a motivational person. If you're not careful, you give your heart, your affection to a false prophet. And when the Bible says, look at the result of their influence upon your life. And look at the result of their influence upon their members. And then when it says, and from such, turn away. Because very difficult for you. Many years ago, I, I love reading a lot. And I, you know, I still read quite a lot. And I, you know, bought all these books and it cost almost a fortune. I, because of, you know, reading one chapter, the one chapter was, was wonderfully great. And then as I plowed and plunged into the book, and I began to read, and there were some deadly, poisonous, erroneous doctrines. And I'd, I'd grown to love the man. I've never met him, just reading his books. Just, just grown to love the man. And then I dropped that, and then I picked up another book, and I, I believe God was, you know, trying to help me and make me see. The first page I opened like this, I saw another arrow shooting out and sticking out like this at me, bold and strong. 
I said, what? So this is what we had. And then I collected all those seeds together and made a bonfire of them. Yes, it was difficult. Not because of the money. I'm not, I don't, I've, I've never cared about money. Never. But it, because of my affection, my intimacy with the man, I've grown to love the man reading his materials. But then I burnt everything. Tough, difficult. That's what you have to do. From such, turn away. When you discover, maybe you didn't know before, but then you now saw that the influence is a negative influence. It's something that will make you to leave the narrow path that leads onto life and lead you onto the broad way that will lead onto perdition, destruction, eternal wrath of God. You say, no, I'm not going to play with my life. And then you get all those materials, you have burned them from such, turn away, the Lord will give you grace. Uh, you, you see, when people give their ears, their mind to lies like that, you may grow to, you may, you may grow to love the lie. And grow to just depend upon the lie. And then if you're not careful, a strong delusion might come upon your life. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish... Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They received not the love of the truth. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter how much truth we bring out here from the word of God. If you don't have love for the truth, the thing will just come on you as uh, water, uh, you know, on the dog's back. It won't make any effect. If there's no love, affection, desire for the truth. And that's why it says over here, all deceivableness of unrighteousness, those false prophets, that's what they have. Deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they do not have the love for the truth that they may be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God will even leave them. Ephraim is joined unto idols. Let him alone. You say, where is that in the Bible? I, I love to know that verse and mark that verse in my Bible. Let me see whether I can search for it. And you know, it's very important. Let's look at Osea chapter 4. Osea chapter 4. Osea chapter 4. That's what the Lord is telling you. Verse 17. Hosea chapter 4. Verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. No fellowship with him again. He'll make his idolatry. His falsehood. To influence you. Don't be so intimate with a false prophet. He was among the people of God before. It's one of the tribes of Israel. Ephraim joined unto idols, let him alone. Come back now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and reading from verse 11. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The followers of the false prophets are the fruits of their ministry. The effect of the message of the false prophets will be seen in the lives of their followers. We cannot judge a preacher, I told you before, by just a few members of the congregation. Because there was an Achan in Joshua's team, a Judas among the disciples of Christ. But when the general effect of the preacher's message on his followers is, corrupt, is corruption, carnality, deception, immorality, covetousness, unrighteousness, hypocrisy, it's a social sign. We must watch and beware of that man. He is a false prophet we're talking about. False prophets make their followers vain. False prophets cause the people to err by their lies. False prophets strengthen also the hands of evil doers that none does return from his wickedness. You know, sometimes you hear the word of God and it strikes you. It kind of, it, it throws the dagger of the word right at the hedge of that sin, of the carelessness. And then you want to repent and turn. And I hope, I pray God will protect you. 
I said God will protect you. And just like you're bending down and praying and all that, saying, oh Lord, I, I want my life to be totally dedicated unto you. Then a false prophet will come to you and say, you look sad and sorrowful. What's the matter with you? Then he will laugh and cheer you up. He, don't want, he doesn't want you to be sad. He doesn't want the impact and the power of the Spirit of God to do its final work, his full work in your life. He just wants you to be happy and laugh away the conviction of the Holy Ghost in your life. And then he'll say, oh, what's the matter with you? And then you say, I, I just discovered my life. I'm coming from the Bible study. I didn't know I've been this careless. True, I've been coming to Bible study. I've been listening to all the messages. But I also see that my heart has been taken away by some messages I'm hearing, which is not central on the not centered on the truth. And then you'll say, uh -huh, that, that's, you know, why you, we all had the same thing. What's the matter with you? Are you so weak in mind? You cannot take everything and still, you know, just shrug it off and still live your life. Hey, you're going to stand by that kind of thing and be so narrow-minded and separated from evil, not conform to this world, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's what you want to get back to now. If you're not careful, they'll make you to drop the conviction that you have. And then the false prophet will come back again. And then they will strengthen the hand of the evil doers. I pray it will not happen to you. In Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 22. Ezekiel 13 verse 22. It says, because with lies have ye made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. And strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Have you ever experienced something like that? You are taking a decision. I don't know how, life, how long life is. I just want to follow the Lord now. And I want every moment of my life to glorify the Lord. And to be based on this unchanging, immutable word of the eternal God. And while you are taking that decision, you cry, you consecrate, and you bring everything back to the altar. I don't like the prayerlessness in my life. I don't like the carelessness in my life. I, I don't like the frivolity in my life. I don't like the unseriousness in my life. Now I want to bring everything back to the altar. And then after you've done that a day or two, you're still like that. You're going on the road, you're praying. You're in your office, you're doing the free time, you're meditating. And then when you get back home, you're saying, oh Lord, you remember the covenant I made with you just this last Monday. I'm going to make everything not to be on the word of God. And after about three days, somebody will come to you. And then all the conviction is washed away. How? How can this be? That we come so often and the impact and the influence of those false pretenders, they are more, more serious in our lives. That the Lord is saying their righteousness is like the morning dew. Their goodness is passed away. Osea once again, let's come back to Osea. Osea chapter 6. Osea chapter 6. Reading from verse, reading from verse 4. Chapter 6, verse O oh, Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee, O oh, Judah? What shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as the morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goes away. That's the problem. That now we consecrate our lives and we say, from now on, false prophets, no way. I'm not going to give them chance in my life anymore. And all the people that are close to me, that I can influence, I'm going to warn them that all the influence and the impact of the false prophets, we need to get rid of them. And then after about one week, then we're back again. And God is saying, oh, Ephraim, what shall I do unto you? Oh, Israel, what can I make of this in your life? You are up, you are down. You are running, then you are slowing down. Your goodness, your decision, your conviction, like the morning dew passes away will become stable. I said will become stable. And all these things shall not ruin our lives anymore in Jesus' name. Corrupt trees produce evil fruits. False prophets raise carnal followers. 
to be carnal is to be sold under sin, to be given to sinful propensities, and to be under the influence of fleshly and worldly desires. It says the carnal mind is against, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Such followers of false prophets become so resistant to saving truth. They hate the law of God while they profess to love God and deserve blessings from him. Under the strong delusion of those false prophets, the religious people believe a lie and believe not the truth and have pleasure in unrighteousness. Eventually the Lord just leave them to their ways. That will not happen to you. Point number three now, courageous firmness against false prophets. Courageous firmness against false prophets. The false prophets don't give up easily. The false prophets cannot be waved off by a wave of the hand. The false prophets are not easy people. Uh, they are not fearful people. They are not timid people for you to scare away easily. The people who are tenacious, they are tough-minded, they have a goal, they have something they want to gain. And what they want to gain is so important to them, they don't give up easily. They want to destroy your soul. And until they make that destruction of your soul a reality, they don't want to give up. And that's why if you're a person that is easily discouraged, and you say, this man has been coming and coming. I know what he's trying to do. He wants to influence me. And he's asking me, ah, ah, I've been coming all this time. Why don't you just visit us in our, in our vigil, night vigil, just once. I'm not telling you to leave your church. Why don't you just read this book that our leader has written. I'm not telling you not to go to Bible study. Why don't you just consider this and consider this and see all the time I've been coming. And then they use sentimental language. They'll try to put some pressure on you emotionally so that eventually you'll say, what can I do now? Even to, to pity him, to satisfy, all right, give it to me. The cook has got you. If they are bold, if your enemy is bold and he wants to take your soul, and he wants to pull you down. And he wants to pour water on the fire that is burning in your soul. And he wants to dilute your conviction. And he wants to crush you and make you to stumble. And he wants to make you go away from the narrow path that leads to heaven. And then wants to get you to the broad way. If they are that bold and aggressive, why don't you also have the same boldness? Why should your enemy and your detractor and the destroyer of your soul be stronger than you are? Why should you let them see that, you know, it's like I wear him down. Drops of water, drops of water every day. Little drop, dropping every day can make a mark on that stone. That's the reason why if they're coming, you want to be able to say, today I'm making up my mind. I am for Jesus. I said I am for Jesus and for this eternal truth. And anything that will take this eternal truth away from me once and for all, I'm going to deal with it and have that courageous firmness against the false prophets. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 If there arise among you a prophet Remember once again among you Among you Within you here Or your community Or a dream of dreams And give us thee a sign or a wonder And the sign or the wonder come to pass Wherefore he spake unto thee saying Let us go after all the gods Which thou hast not known Let us serve them They might have their reason They'll give you a reason for that are you married yet? No, that's what I was telling you. If you just stay there, it will take you a long time. Let's go to another place. Yes, they'll give you water. Yes, they'll give you some oil to rub. Yes, they do some other things. You may not read the Bible. But if you stay just some Bible, 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 when are you going to get married? They give you a reason. 
Let's go to, have you got a child yet? After you got married? How many months? Have got, how many years? Have, no, I've not got. And that's what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. Holiness, holiness. You'll stay there for a long time. Let's go to this other place. They'll tell you to fast for these many days. They'll do this. Uh, the prophet, the pastor may, you know, have to come and bust you at the back of their church. But, you know, once you get a child, what else are you looking for? They'll try to put some pressure on you. Since you came out of school, have you got any job now? I'm still looking. I told you, I told you. I told you, just, you know, just uh, walking for the Lord in your church and reading the Bible and this and that. And I told you, come over with me. They will interpret your dreams for you. As they talk and talk and talk, if your concentration is on having a wife, having a husband, having children, getting a job, getting this and getting that, eventually their pressure will wear you down. I pray they will not wear you down. This heaven will get there together. And nothing will take us away from the path of heaven in Jesus' name. It says in verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the word of that prophet or that dream of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth his trying you, testing you, examining you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God. And then it says, and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. You count him as dead. You count him as dead. And if you count him as dead, you'll not be, you know, reading his books and listening to his cassettes and mentioning his name. Forget him. Once to destroy you. Once to take you back to Egypt. Forget about him. He's dead. Is dead spiritually, is dead to righteousness, is dead to the way of truth. What's your concern with him? And what's your concern for him? It's dead, it's gone. Take him away from your heart. And it, and it says, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And redeemed you out of the house of bondage. So thrust thee out of the way. Which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put evil away from the midst of thee. If thy brother. This is the difficult part. Thy brother. Thy brother. Or the son of the son of thy mother. Or thy son. Or thy daughter. Or thy wife. This is something. Your wife who has been coming here with you, reading the Bible with you. Your wife who has been centered and committed on the word of God together with you. Or your husband, committed to this word, this doctrine of life eternal. If that wife will meet somebody in the market, meet somebody in the place of work, Meet somebody somewhere and they'll be introducing some things to her. Woman, why don't you tell your husband? The prophets want to see you together. And the prophet says, if your husband does not come with you, then you will not be able to have what the prophet will give. And then you woman, don't you know how to compel your husband? You're a woman, you don't understand. You know what he wants. Deny him of what he wants. And then he will ask you and say, my wife, why are you doing this? And you say, sis, uh, you know, I told you, let us go together. You didn't go with me. If you don't go with me, this one, I'm not going to give it to you. You say, if I will die, I will die with conviction. Give me a good amen. amen. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die with a righteous, unchanging, immovable principle. I knew the Lord before I married you. I knew the Lord before I knew you. And if it's on this matter, you will not get me to listen to a false prophet. Give me a good amen. amen. If you don't take your stand like that, and you're kind of, you know, my wife, all right. 
If you want us to go to hell, what? You want to spend eternity in hell because of the woman, because of the man? I will not get to hell. Come what may. Come what may. What's the price? The world is trying to give. Your wife, your husband, your son, your brother, your relative. He has started a new ministry. And they're dancing and drumming and burning candles and wearing white garments. And he's saying, uh-uh, we're relatives together. You cannot even come and visit me. And, and these men, they want to establish this and establish that. And then they say, my wife, you know, if you are not there, they will, you know, say, well, since your wife is not with you, we don't trust you. So if you want my ministry to prosper, come with me. No, I don't want the ministry of the false prophet to prosper. Do you? That's why it says in verse 6, If thy brother, that the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, thy friend, which is as thy own soul. You see, that's, that's what gets some people into false doctrine. What they say is my friend. We have been intimate, close friends since our childhood. And since this is the way she is going, this is the way she wants wedding, reception, marriage to go. We are friends. I don't really agree with her, but I hate to make her unhappy. You know, we were so friendly and we we're so close. And I just want to do everything to keep her friendship. You want to lose your soul and go to hell forever because you want to keep friendship. What kind of friendship? Were you born the same day? Did you come out of the same womb? Even if you came out from the same mother, the son of thy mother, the daughter of your mother, you're not going to go to hell because of another person? Whoever the false prophet may be, this night you'll take them out of your heart. And then it says, because he wants to get you out of the out of the way, the way of the Lord who redeemed you out of the land of Egypt to redeem you out of the house of bondage. Now, because of what he wants to do, he wants to say, Go and let us worship other world, verse 7, namely, of the gods of the people which are now about you, nice unto thee, or far off from thee. From one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him. You will not consent. Nor hearken unto him. Neither shall thine eye pity him. Neither shall thou spare. Neither shall thou conceal him. We'll expose them. And we're not going to agree with anybody that wants to destroy our souls with false doctrine. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Amen. Amen. This truth the Lord has given us, we're not going to sell it. We're not going to give it away for any reason. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Sell it not. Proverbs 24, verse 21. And verse 22, my son, fear thou the Lord and the king. Meddle not with them that are giving to change. Don't go around with people who are giving to change. They believe this today. They believe this tomorrow. They believe this at this time. They believe this another time. Meddle not. With them that are giving to change. They don't have conviction. They don't have stability. And they cannot stand on the authority of the word of God. Against the false prophets and say. This is where I stand. Don't be like them. You'll have backbone. I said you'll have backbone. You will stand. 
in verse 22, for their calamity shall rise suddenly. The people that are, you know, here and there changing and they will not stay by the standard of the word of God for their calamity shall rise suddenly. And who knoweth the ruin of them both? Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, we're looking at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye learn, which ye have learned. And do what? And do what? Avoid them. How do you avoid somebody? You are at home and you know the fellow is coming at a peculiar hour. Avoid them. Go out and go and do evangelism. You are taken this way. You know that he's coming that same way. And if he meets you, he has a way of getting somebody to conversation. Avoid them. Or you are together and then you are discussing something. He has a way of tilting and moving the conversation to come back to put in pressure on you to that false doctrine. Avoid them. Don't allow their impact, their influence to have anything to do with you. They cause divisions contrary to the doctrines which you learn. The Bible says, avoid them. Why? Verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That's why I told you you must be strong. If you're simple, like a simple tongue, and you're weak and timid, and you're looking down and you're trembling and shaking when they begin to kind of uh, wave their false doctrine before you they'll get you stand up and look straight in their face and say you are not a servant of the almighty god whom i serve get out of my way you must be that firm for you to overcome you are going to overcome and then we're looking at second timothy chapter three second timothy chapter three Reading from verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue. I will continue. And you know, as they're getting worse and worse, and they begin to introduce this, introduce that, it says, but continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own laws shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things and do afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. You will not fall. Jude verses 3 and 4. Jude. Verses 3 and 4, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend, earnestly contend, earnestly, fervently, courageously, energetically contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept into our church unawares. They sneak in into the ministry unawares who are before ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. You will stand for the truth, you will not compromise. And although these uh, false doctrine are uh, filling the land, they may get other people, they will not get you. 
you'll stand on this word of salvation. And you'll stand on this word of holiness and sanctification. And the totality of this word of God, you are going to abide by it. You have your Bible there? Where's your Bible? Raise it up, let me see. You'll stand by it. And no false prophet will make you deviate from this word of God. Am I right? We can stand together. Why don't you stand? And you tell the Lord with your Bible in the hand. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm not going to be like jellyfish, like an amphibian that has no backbone. With courage and fortitude and fearlessness. I'm going to stand. You tell the Lord, if the false prophets are nearby, you reject them. If the false prophets are far away, you, you reject them. And you stand for the truth of this living God. This is what will take us to, ev to heaven, to eternal life. All the things we have been learning in this church. The word of repentance, the word of restitution, the word of righteousness. All those ancient marks that the Lord Almighty God has said, earnestly contending for the faith, was delivered unto the saints. The word of salvation, the word of separation from the world, and the word of sanctification, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You want to stand on that word. Stand on that word. And a word of one man, one marriage, you know, in the will of God, not playing tricks or playing pranks or telling lies, but standing on the truth of the word of God to get married in the way of the Lord. You want to stand. You want to stand. You want to stand. It will take some courage. It will take some boldness that no matter who deviates and deflects, you're going to stand on the word of God. You will not compromise. You're not going to pity somebody and then sell your soul unto them, whoever they are. Beware of false prophets. And if you find that some influence has been coming to your life, and you're no more standing on the word of God solidly, aggressively, faithfully, in a committed way, like you were standing before, now they can easily shift you you are easily influenced now you are not a man of decision a man of conviction a woman of decision a woman of conviction anymore that's why you are, you are going you are going the trend of the world today you want to plant your feet on the solid rock the rock of ages upon this rock i build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against that church you want to be among the militant people of god the triumphant people of god that will not shift you will not shift your ground you will stand why don't you tell the lord give me grace give me strength and give me the ability to stand upon your word. And all this spirit of carelessness, of frivolity, of unseriousness, shaking from the foundation. Lord, take it away from me. And the warning you are giving me tonight, beware of false prophets. Oh Lord, let me take it to heart. Burn their books. Throw away their tapes reject their influence avoid them in every way for the sake of your soul you will stand a backsliding son a backsliding daughter will not put pressure on you and succeed for you to backslide with him with her a straying husband a backsliding wife will not put any pressure on you and then for you to succumb and then fall and backslide with him with her. You see, on this rock I stand. All of the grounds, the shifting sand. I'm not going to allow anyone, any false prophet nearby or far away to influence me to shift from where I stand. Beware of false prophets. You won't go to them, but they may come to you. They come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, the ravening wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Watch their character. You'll know them. 
Watch their conduct, you'll know them. Watch their preaching, their utterances, you'll know them. Watch their converts, their disciples, the people they have influenced. Do you want to become like them? Like their falling, backsliding disciples? Watch them. Avoid them. If you are a follower of Christ, you listen to the words of Christ. If you are a believer in Christ, you listen to the word of Christ. If you are a true child of God, you listen to the warning the Lord is giving us. You will not play with your soul. Beware of false prophets. In whichever way they come, aggressive, or maybe they are mild, tender, loving, and I want to give you some money. Be like Abraham, reject their gifts. Be like Daniel before Belshazzar. Let your gifts stay with you. I won't sell my soul for naira, for dollars, for pounds, for savers. I'll not sell my soul for any gift from anybody. Don't let them take you, swallow you up, suck you in by their apparent good appearance. Be watchful, be sharp sighted. That once a false prophet comes your way, say, No, I made up my mind, I'm not going to perish. Made up my mind, I'm going to follow Jesus till the very end. Made up my mind, I bought the truth. I'm not going to sell it. I made my mind, I made up my mind, I made them consecration. I will not meddle with those who are given to change. Maybe they have been here before inside the same ministry, inside the same church. And now they said they have discovered another thing. And they want to sway you. They want to destroy you. You're making up your mind. And you're telling the Lord, not even a friend, a bosom friend, a member of the family, my family, will be able to sway me, deceive me, distract me, so also destroy my soul. I've made up my mind, I want to follow the Lord, and I'll follow him to the very end. Mark them, avoid them. Beware of false prophets. They come to you. Sheep's clothing. Inwardly the revenue woes. And you shall know them by their fruits. You see the lives of their followers. You don't want them to destroy your life. To destroy your conviction. To run you down and crush you. And to make you a nobody in the kingdom. Like they have done to their followers. Be on your guard. Watch. Beware. Stand for the truth. 